My name is Russ Hodge. I'm a science writer and communications trainer at the Max Delborg Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. That's a part of the Helmholtz Association. Um, this is the first part of a course that I give um, in many different sort of contexts to a lot of different organizations. Um, it's a theoretical introduction to some issues with science communication that I've been working on for many years. And it's intended for people who are professional science communicators or just scientists who would like to improve their communication skills. Anyone who's interested in science, knowing how scientists think, it's intended for teachers and any, any kind of stakeholder um, in this whole area of science communication. I'd like to start by saying, I think that we have fundamentally misunderstood or at least greatly underappreciated the relationship between communication and science. Um, I think they're profoundly linked at a level that is extremely important, not only for, for communication, but also for research itself. And I think the fact that we failed to understand this has had important consequences in all kinds of ways. It's affected how we teach science, it's affected how we do research, and it's certainly affected how we communicate science in all kinds of contexts. Um, so this is my sort of manifesto again, uh, science and communication are connected in profound ways that we've basically fundamentally understood, misunderstood, or at least greatly underestimated. If we expose this relationship to do that, we need a model of how science communication works and how it goes wrong. Um, failing to understand this and failing to have such a model has consequences for communication, teaching, and research. Now, this is a big claim. I, I understand that. And my experience has been that when you take this message to scientists and research organizations, one of the reasons that they have failed to take this whole issue of science communication very seriously in some ways um, has been the fact that there's not a very good model of how it works and how it should work. And my aim today is to demonstrate this connection, but how I, how I find these two things are connected. And I'm gonna do that using lots of examples from real practice. Um, and many of the examples that I are gonna use uh, will come from cases where a scientist had been challenged to talk to the public uh, or to people who are not specifically from their field. But as I'll try to demonstrate, the same kinds of issues arise in communication between experts. Um, this works best, this type of lecture in this format works best if all the way along you try to apply it to your own work and try to recognize yourself and the communication situations and research situations you are typically involved in if you try to apply these ideas to what you're doing. And you'll see in some cases they fit and in some cases they won't fit very well. And one of the purposes of putting this out there is to start a dialogue about how this works, how it can work better and how to improve the model that I'm trying to develop. Now, all of this comes from personal experience. I've been a science communicator for 25 years now. And I did not formally study science. My own background is in linguistics and psychology. And so I was unfamiliar with the natural sciences in any structured or systematic way or formal way. And so it was incredibly challenging to be plunged into a situation of writing about a field like molecular biology without a background in that field. Um, when I started, I was immediately asked to start writing about real papers and real work. And I was also asked, being someone with a background in writing and communications, uh, to train scientists to help try to help them fix their own problems in communication, or at least to show them some, give them some ideas about how to work better and to achieve these things better. Because they were all struggling. And, and, and I found this all the time. So it really surprised me to find that although communication is essential every day in science, you're doing some sort of communication, a lot of researchers have real problems with it. Now, 
some of this obviously can can be attributed to lack of training in in continental Europe um, and many places of the world. Communication, writing, and these types of skills are not part of the curriculum. They're added on, sort of in a sort of soft skills uh, category or whatever. That's not the case where I come from, the United States. It's also not the case in the United Kingdom, where scientists tend to write a lot more during their studies at every level, and they get a lot of feedback on that. Um, in my case, in Germany and in other places in Europe. I was often encountering a situation where PhD students were really for the very first time having to write something, either a major paper or their dissertation, or having to go give a big talk, and they were totally unprepared for this. And so the approach to try to solve those problems was to carry out some kind of workshops and hire some sort of teacher um, to help train them. And that was the situation I found myself in when I was asked to start this type of training. Um, at that time, my background was in teaching and writing. And I quickly realized that the didactics of this whole field was far behind. So and anyway, what I want to say is that a lot of the problems that scientists have simply come from the fact that they haven't been trained in this, they haven't been given good feedback. There are obviously also second language issues uh, that have to do with the fact that a lot of scientists, most of them have to write in English and give talks in English, and that's not their native language, and that causes problems. But I was very surprised to find that the, the most significant problems were a different type, and that they had to do with content. And scientists, the young scientists I was working with, had the most trouble for some reason, and this is a, this is a well-known fact, but they had the most trouble describing their own work. And the key issues seemed to be, they had trouble distinguishing main points from details. Um, they would give a piece of information without establishing any context that would sort of lend it meaning. Along the way, as they would tell a story, they would leave gaps or there would be jumps in logic. and the biggest problem overall has always been that for some reason people just seem to have real trouble finding the clearest way to express an idea and that's interesting because i think the naive view of communication and science communication is you think something you throw it into language and it all works out somehow. And actually this process of what we think and, and tying that to an appropriate language or sorting out the language needed to explain that to someone else tends to be a very complicated process. Now, we've all seen plenty of examples of this, particularly now in the situation where society is kind of engaged in a scientific crisis around the COVID um, virus. And we've seen all kinds of examples of, of good and bad science communication. This is not obviously the first time that this kind of crisis has occurred. And the first example I'd like to show you of sort of science communication gone wrong goes all the way back to um, 1982. This is almost 40 years ago at the time I'm giving this talk now. Um, and um, the situation was the following, uh, the centers for for disease control in the United States had been alerted to the presence of a disease that would turn out to be AIDS. Um, they called it GRID at the time. And this was particularly uh, significant in the gay community in San Francisco. And um, so th the CDC appointed a, a, a group of scientists to try to figure out what was causing this disease. And they did what's called a cluster study, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and they presented their findings, their first findings in a press conference on June 18th, 1982. Um, and what happened at that press conference is really interesting. And this is reported in a book called And the Band Played On, a, a fascinating book about the AIDS epidemic, the early days of the AIDS epidemic by a guy named Randy Schultz, a journalist from San Francisco. And during the press conference, after the scientific results had sort of been presented, a reporter stood up and asked, are you saying AIDS is or is not a sexually transmittable disease? And the head of the CDC at the time, Jim Curran, gave the following answer. 
The existence of a cluster study provides evidence for an hypothesis that people in the study are not randomly associated with each other, and the study is a sexual cluster. On the other hand, we don't have enough scientific evidence to say for certain that one person gives it to another person. We have to focus much more research into this area so that we don't prematurely release information that's not validated. On the other hand, we're not holding back any information that might provide important health benefits. Thank you. Uh, this scene is reported in the book, and it also appears verbatim in a film that was made based on this book, also called And the Band Played On. And this is a really interesting statement, because if you talk to an epidemiologist or someone who's doing this kind of research, and you ask them about whether this is a good answer or not, well, they'll say, scientifically, it's quite accurate. But Obviously, for the reporters, there was something missing, and a lot of people went away from this not understanding what he'd said. And the danger in this is that um, they may go away with the impression not only that you know they didn't understand, but that scientists are hiding something or doing dangerous things they don't want to know us as to know about. That may be the case sometimes, but. In this situation, there are actually two ways to look at this. One might say, okay, they were hesitant to alarm the public. Um, so they gave a strictly scientific answer. On the other hand, um, there could have been politics involved. And it's very difficult to say, but the main thing is, is that by giving this kind of answer, you've explained what you've found, but you haven't explained what it means. And we're gonna talk again and again about this issue of what things mean um, during this session. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how we're gonna proceed here. And the first thing is, um, I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to just outline a little bit how I'm gonna break this down today. So the first thing is, I'm gonna talk about the process that I went through in trying to build a model of good and bad scientific communication practices and, and just to understand how it works and what's going on there. Um, it's not comprehensive and it may not be suitable for all, all, it's obviously not suitable for all contexts, but I did find that having a model turns out to be very help, helpful. Um, I'm gonna talk about a concept that I call ghosts and I'm gonna talk about how that relates to scientific models and how it relates to what things in science mean. And <clears throat> all of this is going to come together because we're going to talk about how these concepts apply to communication strategies. And then I'm going to try to take another step and show that those the process of going through this, this communication process can actually improve your research. And again, I know this is a great challenge. And when I come to research institutes to give this talk, I know right from the beginning that a lot of people have this view of communication. Well, it's a pretty package that you can put something in. And again, I think that comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of how these two things are related to each other. Uh, when we've done all that, <laughs> then actually this, this process goes on in workshops and courses where I show how it's really easy to take the model that I've developed and translate it into practical strategies that influence how we learn science. So it's helped me when I have to learn a new piece of science, how you communicate it, how you teach it, and then again, how you do research. So I told you that my experience was, I found that lots and lots and lots of scientists were having trouble somehow communicating their ideas, but that's not universally true. I did also meet a group of scientists who were exceptionally good at communicating their work. And interestingly enough, a lot of those turned out to be Nobel Prize winners. During my early career, I had the chance to talk to 15 or 16 of these people. And this, these are some of the Nobel Prize winners that I met directly and usually was able to have pretty intensive one-on-one -on -one chats with. And what surprised me was that these people tended to be extremely good at talking about what they were doing and putting it into a context. And even to someone like me who was really unfamiliar with, with the science that they were doing, 
I always left thinking, okay, I know what they did. I know why they did it. And I kind of know what it means. I know why they won a Nobel Prize for this thing. Um, this is not a representative sample of Nobel Prize winners. These are just the ones that I've talked to personally. Anyway, these encounters led me to ask a question and that was, is there a connection between doing science at that level of greatness and communicating it very well? And I actually think there is. And so part of the process that I've been through and the model that I've developed is an attempt to show how those two things are connected to each other. Now you can see this for yourself. You don't have to talk to them individually. You can go to the Nobel Prize website and generally the prize winners give two lectures when they receive the award. They give a plenary lecture, which is to, to um, expert, more geared towards scientists and experts, but they also often give a banquet speech. And in this banquet speech, that's for people like the King of Sweden, and who are not necessarily scientists. Um, and again, some of these are brilliant examples of taking a very complex, sophisticated piece of science and breaking it down and explaining it for anyone. Now, again, that's sort of public communication of science. And it's really important to think all the way along that everything I'm gonna talk about is, is also a, a factor in communication between experts. So how was I going to try to develop a model of how science communication works and how it's connected to research. Okay, so I decided to take a kind of scientific approach to this problem. And I took a page from early genetics. And th this came from some, some historical reading I'd done on the early days of genetics in the lab of Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was studying fruit flies. Um, and early on, he didn't intend to do that, but early on, as he was looking at these flies, a, a, a sort of key concept arose, and that is when they found a fly that had a mutation, for example, its eyes were white instead of red, then, and, and this mutation was passed along in a Mendelian dominant pattern so that it was easy to recognize, they, they realized that these mutations had a logic, and that is, if you see an error, it's telling you something about the healthy function of a gene. So the gene that produced white eyes and flies, its function was actually to make the eyes red. And so I thought maybe we can do something similar for communication. Maybe I can look at problems and maybe those problems or those errors or issues, they're trying to tell me something about how good scientific communication works. And um, so I spent years, I had all of these examples for my courses and after, after years of just not sort of fumbling around and, and trying to understand these things, I decided to take the systematic approach to it. And when I did, I started to find some really amazing things. And that is, there were, there were three things that really surprised me. The first were, was that communication problems which arise between experts are, are very similar to the kinds that they have with non-experts. They're not, it, that's not, automatically obvious, but if you if you really look at them from a kind of structural or cognitive or linguistic point of view, they, they are actually, in fact, very similar. Secondly, the most significant problems that people have with communication have something to do with the way scientists think about their work, and they also have something to do with the way a scientist understands the goal of a communication task. We're going to talk about that also quite a bit, too. Um, then I discovered, as I had hoped, that these problems have a hidden logic, that, that, that there's always a reason for a problem. And if you figure out that reason and expose it, then you, you're not only improving scientific communication, but you're improving the place where the problem occurred, and that is in the thinking. And then ultimately, this can improve research. And I'm going to take you through those steps now. Now, obviously, what we communicate and how we communicate something depends a lot on whom we're communicating with. So whatever the answer to that question is in any particular case, let's, let's just for today, let's assume that the goal is always, whatever audience you have, you want to help them get a basic understanding of what a scientist has actually done 
why they were interested in doing that, why they did it, and what the question and the answer means to them. Not what it means to me, um, but what it means to them. So now, and this is, this is kind of complicated because it's not enough just to say what somebody found. It's, it's not the same as saying what it means. And it's also not necessarily explaining why you did something. So if we go back to that first example we had, it's a real clear case of how saying what you found isn't the same as saying what that finding means. Again, most people say that Curran's answer to this is, is an accurate, technically accurate answer, um, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't explain the meaning of that answer. Um, so, and, and I'm gonna rewrite this later in the presentation. I'm gonna show you an alternative that he could have given that might have helped fix some of these problems. Now, sometimes to explain the meaning of something, you have to say more. You just have to explain more things. And, but, but I found that it's usually, in most cases, it's more what you say, what the choices you make about what you say, and then how you structure the message that you're trying to present rather than just adding a bunch of details or definitions of things. Um, and in either case, if you don't explain the meaning of something, then three things are probably gonna happen. And, and this is actually what happened when Curran gave his answer. So the reporters, some of them just interpreted what he said wrong and they went off and reported it wrong. And I've had many cases of this in, in my career. I've seen reporters interpret stories in the most ridiculous ways, um, simply because they hadn't understood something. Another possible outcome is a, a reporter didn't understand what he said, and so they, they wrote it down and they took it to another scientist and said, explain this to me. And then hopefully that person got it right or explained it in a way that they could understand. And the third possible answer is people will just think you're being obnoxious or secretive and trying to hide something. And, and that can happen even when it's simply, you know, if, if you're studying the most banal aspect of cellular biology and you report it wrong, still people can think, oh, he's hiding something from me. I've seen this happen also, which is kind of interesting. So let me give you an alternative version of what Curran could have said. And this one's quite a bit longer. Um, and, but I'll show you some examples later where I actually didn't change the link. And all I tried to do was to give a context for what he was saying and, and, um, and he had as much time as he wanted at the press conference. People weren't gonna run off and, and, and you know, they, they were gonna hang around for his answer. So let's imagine he had a little more time, took a little more time and he could have said something like this. Now this is not the only answer in any case and it's just an example, but the reporter could have asked, are you saying AIDS is or is not a sexually transmittable disease? Well, it's often the case that we discover a disease before we identify the bacteria and virus or the other agent that causes it. And finding that agent can be a long process. In the meantime, it's crucial to do the very best we can to learn how it's transmitted so that we can slow it down and keep it from spreading. And right now, the best approach we have to figure out mode of transition in cases like this is called a cluster study. A cluster study works like this. We identify the people who have a disease and collect information about them. Then we want to know whether they might have infected each other. So we look at whether they had any interactions with each other. And then we look at whether some type of interaction corresponds to the type of pattern of infections in a logical way. So if a disease is sexually transmitted, for example, the pattern should probably show that people who have the disease previously had sex with someone else who's infected. And if it's transmitted in some other way, then you wouldn't see that type of pattern. It would probably look random. It would certainly look different. So now we've done this preliminary study and um, what we this study showed that several people who have GRID, that's what it was called at the time, had prior sexual contact with someone else who has the disease. Then they went on to have sex with other people and some of those people also contracted it. The pattern 
we found between those individuals seems to be statistically significant. In other words, if given two assumptions that the disease is striking just random people or that it's transmitted by sex, the current evidence favors the latter scenario. And this is as, actually this is from 1984, but this is one of those cluster studies involving what they called patient zero or patient O and a pattern that showed the people he'd had sex with who had the disease and who were exhibiting symptoms, et cetera, et cetera, different stages. Again, this is from later, but the principle is the same. Right now, our sample is quite small, so we can't absolutely rule out that people with the disease are connected in some other way that we haven't discovered yet. So we haven't reached the level of certainty that most scientists would require for proof. And that may not happen until we actually identify the agent that causes the disease. But the results are significant enough that we think the public should have this information. It's entirely possible that we're dealing with a new and very dangerous sexually transmittable disease. So that not only says what the scientists found, but it says how the study was done. It shows how such studies are sort of intuitively logical or rational. And it also shows what it means. It doesn't oversimplify. It doesn't say yes or no. The reporter asked him a yes, no question. But it does put things into context. So I'm not going to dissect this now. We're going to look at a lot of other cases of science communication and show what the parts of answers are and what the parts are. Um, but but we're gonna we're gonna focus mostly on this question of what things mean, and we're gonna find that in science things mean things in a certain way that's a little bit different than in let's put it other kinds of communication, not entirely different and not a different type, but but different in in degree in a certain way. So what do things mean? Let's take another example, and this is from a paper that a friend of mine was writing. And if you're not a biologist, this can be tough going, sorry, but that's all right. It's, it's a good example for that reason. So we're talking about something in cells and we're talking about a process that's involved in activating genes and it has something to do with cancer research because the molecules that the scientist is talking about are involved in many types of cancer. So the text goes like this, cells constantly produce and degrade the molecule beta catenin Normally, it's bound to a complex that is targeted for destruction. Signaling by WENT, this molecule WENT, blocks the formation of this complex, leaving higher quantities of beta catenin. That means it can enter the nucleus and activate target genes. Okay, what does all of this mean? So a lot of people think that the problem with science communication is that scientists know a lot more stuff than other people. And of course that's true, but it's in fact it's in fact more than that. So to understand this text, you have to understand certain types of things. You have to understand some terms and concepts like produce and degrade and molecule and this thing called beta catenin. You also have to understand how they're related to each other. And you have to know a little bit about the geography of the cell. You have to know where things are. So. And that's, there's a really interesting story about that. Um, I, I showed exactly this text to a course a couple of weeks ago. And in that course was a computer scientist who was analyzing exactly this signaling system within cells. And he didn't know a really fundamental thing about this. And that is that this molecule called WENT is actually outside the cell and it docks onto the surface of the cell under a receptor molecule. He didn't know that, and he's even working with this. So anyway, the, the other thing is, so you need to know some basic things about cells and terms and concepts. You need to know how they're related to each other. And you also need to realize that this text is, is reporting a kind of film-like sequence of things. And the scientist is kind of watching that happen in their heads. And so, for example, um, here, here's, here's a bit about the geography of the cell. So this is a little slice of a big cell that would be much larger, it'd be a big circle out here. And this is the membrane that separates the cell from the exterior. This is the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm. And this is 
the nucleus, which is a compartment inside that even. And outside the cell comes along this molecule went and it docks onto this structure here. And that releases this beta catenin molecule which can then go into the nucleus. And what it does is it docks onto genes and it activates them and it tells the cell to produce different molecules, which it needs for various things. So a scientist knows that geography. And this, these little balls here are part of what's called a signaling pathway. And that is a, a, a system of molecules that act in a certain order and in certain configurations in order to pass along information, for example, from the outside of the cell to the cell's genes. Now, um, there's other ways to, this is actually way, way more complex. And here's another type of signaling pathway, which shows that, you know, all of these things are actually doing lots of different things and singly and in different combinations they move all around the cell and interact with all kinds of other partners. So we're learning more and more about this. And there's even, this is one way of drawing the ideas in that text. This is another way of drawing them. And there's yet another way in the computer of modeling this because these things are so complex, we can't even really keep them in our heads anymore. And so we have a system like this, which shows all of the pieces of a different, this is called the TNF pathway. It's not beta continuum, doesn't matter. It's the same principle. We have all these components interacting with each other in all these different kinds of ways. And the reason why we're interested in this is because my friend was trying to build a model of how this whole system works. And um, with another molecule called NF kappa B, and he was trying to put that into an algorithm. So here's another way of mathematically representing the relationships between those pieces in that system, because what they're trying to understand is how to change the output, how to change the way that it activates genes, where you could introduce a drug and interfere with this whole messy system and so on. So, so these are all different ways of representing what's in his head and what's in the scientific literature and what people have learned about the system. So we, we, again, we have this algorithm, then we have this much more complex sort of computer model, and then we have these simple diagrams, or we can have a text. All of these are different ways of sort of explaining the same thing. And the question is, and, and, and in fact, to understand this story, you need to know not only the things that we talked about, but you need to know even more things. So for example, this is, a, this is a story about gene expression or which genes are activated at what times in what cells. And that theme is related to lots of other things. So it's related somehow to evolution and cell biology and a whole field of biochemistry, including what we call gene expression and the physics of cells, which is called structure and molecules, which is called structural biology and physics in general. So, what do I need to know in order to understand that story? And as a science writer plunged into a laboratory and having to write about this, this was a huge thing for me. I was confronting these things all the time. So what this showed me is that a scientist has what I call an inner laboratory, an inner laboratory. An inner laboratory is, it's like a real laboratory. It's got things in it. It's got like concepts like molecules it's got it's got relationships between things like it's got it's got maps in it of cells it's got under uh, models of evolution it's got physical principles in it it's got equipment in it in a certain way and and if i wanted to understand what a scientist was telling me i had to be able to see what was in that laboratory. So I couldn't just understand the text because the text meant something because it was related to all of these other things and those things were inside. So I had to be able to see that somehow. So how was I gonna get into this inner laboratory? How could I make us? And, and a lot of times I would, I would not understand something simply because the scientists had a piece of the inner laboratory or they were watching a kind of film and they weren't telling me that, or they didn't 
I couldn't see it myself. So I had to learn, first of all, that this inner laboratory existed. And secondly, I had to learn sort of how to get them to talk about it. Now, to, to show you how complex this actually is, I'm, I wanna use another metaphor. And we're talking, what we're really talking about is this, this mental organization, this inner laboratory, it's kind of like an architecture. It's, it's, got, it's got things in it and they're organized in a certain way. They're related to each other. So if we're gonna talk about this inner laboratory, um, and, and, and again, it, it goes way beyond just knowing facts. Um, it has, it, it's not just a copy of reality. Um, it, it has things in it and, and each scientist has had to put it together, him or herself, and they've had to build it. And it includes concepts, models of things, relationships between things. It contains the assumptions they have about how things work and um, how a vaccine works and whether how, how you test whether it works and what a cluster study is and what a signaling pathway in a cell is. And so if you want to understand a piece of science, you have to see what's in that laboratory and how it's organized. And that's also interesting because if you look at the same text a scientist wrote 100 years ago, and a scientist would look at that text today, in, in many cases, they would see the same text, but they would read it completely differently. And the difference is this inner laboratory. So again, I wanna show you a metaphor of this. We're talking about kind of a cognitive architecture or mental architecture. So let's let's use some architecture. Let's draw some architecture and use that as an example. So this is the architectural plan of a building on our campus here in Berlin. It's called the Berlin Institute for Medical Systems Biology. And the architects produced this plan for me because it has everything in it. The blue lines here are walls. And it also has the ventilation system and the electrical system and the water and the ventilation system. And it, it just has everything in there that they needed to build it. Now, an architect won't even look at this and read it. They will peel it apart into different layers. They'll say, okay, here's the physical structure to understand it. But, but that's kind of like what's in a person's head. It's this huge, massive accumulation of information that's overlaid on top of each other. And, and when we're thinking about a certain thing, we can peel out part of it and say, okay, how's this wire connected to this wire? Well, as a metaphor, that's okay, but it's way too complicated. So let's, let's simplify it a little bit. <clears throat> and the way we're going to simplify it is I asked my sister to draw a scheme, a diagram of her house. And here's what she drew. And um, she, I said, it doesn't have to be very sophisticated. It doesn't have to be completely accurate. I just want to see how you see the space in that house in your head. So this is what she drew. And you can see there's rooms and they have relative sizes and they have specific positions related to each other. And here's the kitchen and the living room and the master bedroom and the boys room and the bath and the garage. Now, my sister who's older than I am has grandchildren. And at the time she has identical twins. And that was important to me because for this exercise, I wanted a control group. So identical twins is a good, good control group, gives you a good control group. What do you think would happen if you ask a child to draw the same space? A child, an eight-year-old child. Well, I think you might be surprised. I mean, I didn't know what to expect, but I thought maybe we'll learn something. So I asked the child to draw the same, her, her twins. And the, the first was Derek. Um, and this is what he drew. Um, this is his plan of the same house. And he has the living room. The, this Again, he was eight years old. He's much older now. And I, I hope he doesn't see this because he might be, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the kitchen, and then you have the bedroom and bedroom. And you can see all these pieces are here. And what's interesting is, they're in the same, pretty much the same sort of relationships to each other as in my sister's drawing. So you have, he didn't put the garage here, but you have the kitchen and the living room. And you see, there's also this corner here. And then there's a bedroom and another bedroom, which are back here. And then there's a bathroom in the bathroom. Now, before we draw any major conclusions from this, let's look at the way his twin drew the house. And this is what it looked like kitchen, living room, bedroom, bedroom, 
and he also included the backyard and he put a wall, a really fat wall here. Interesting. And he, he put the backyard here and he said, PS massive. And I, in fact, didn't notice this until I used this drawing lots of times in courses and somebody pointed out to me. Anyway, also here again, we find that the relationships between the spaces are pretty well preserved. He's got the kitchen and the living room and the two bedrooms and the bathroom. And then he has the stairs downstairs. Um, but but still, by looking at these images, you can see that there's a difference. There, there's some fundamental difference between the way um, space, my, my, my nephews and my sisters see space. And if you, it, it, and this shows you that children have um, a different concept of space and these drawings show that they lack two rules that every adult knows implicitly. And if you go back and look at those drawings, you can tell what they are. So let's look at this one again. I, li I like this one. This was what I call the octopus house. And I like this one. The, the first is that you can see that the wall of one room, we know that the wall of one room is the back of the wall of the room next door. So they share a wall and the, the boys don't seem to know this. So so. And, and this is an interesting experiment you can perform with a child. You can say, go in the next room and I'm gonna knock on the wall on this place. And you have to guess where you'll hear the sound. And they really won't know because once they go through that doorway, it's like they lose this concept of relationship somehow. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that they don't understand is that if you were to walk around the outside of the house, it has a shape. and all of the pieces have to fit into that shape. So they shouldn't be, you know, just floating out here somewhere. It all has to be inside the square. Now, there's a couple of things that are really, in I mean, this explains some things. I don't know how it was for you, but when I was a child, when a small child, I always wondered whether there might be secret compartments or secret passageways or secret rooms in the house I lived in. and. If you look at these pictures, you can understand how a child might easily think that because a child doesn't know you can actually figure that out by measuring things and measuring whether they all fit into a space or not. Um, and the other thing you find, again, you find out that children have different rules and they there's certain things that they don't understand. But the, the thing that's really interesting about this is that you only find that out you, you can't find that out by asking them, where's the other room? They'll say, well, you go out the door and turn to the left. That's right. But you only find this by making them communicate, by making them draw the house. So the lesson to learn from this is that you, without communication, you can't really see how someone else's knowledge is organized. You, you can't really see how the inner laboratory or even how something as fundamental as space is organized and whether we have the same rules for things. And so there's an invisible structure, there's, there are invisible things in our heads that dictate whether we are really communicating with each other, whether we understand things in the same way. And what I discovered very quickly was that the most common reason for disruptions in science communication and a lot of other kinds of communications was this invisible structure that wasn't in the talk or in the text. You know, a drawing doesn't have the rules in it. And so there was something invisible. There was this entire laboratory behind this inner laboratory that was actually determining what things meant and whether they meant something and so I needed a word for something that is disruptive and invisible. So I picked one and I just decided to call it ghosts because a ghost is something invisible in, in popular literature and horror films. A ghost is disruptive, but it's invisible. So, and again, invisible means it's not in the communication. It's not in the text. It's not talked about in the talk. Just like uh, in, in Jim Curran's talk, he didn't explain what a cluster study is, or in the text about wind and beta catenin, it didn't explain what a molecule is. 
And those, those are maybe just definitions, but ghosts can be all, there are all kinds of other ones and I kept finding new kinds. So they can be information, just simple piece of information. They can be entire concepts like natural selection or heredity. They can be patterns or all kinds of other knowledge and they're not in the text or the talk and they're not in the image, but to understand what it means, you have to know those things. And then I found that learning to understand, to recognize that ghosts exist and that they're in communication and identifying them is really essential for learning and communicating science. So again, there are things that are not, that you don't define them in the talk, you don't explain them, um, and they may even not be related to science. And, and as I said, they disrupt, the ghosts are in all kinds of communication. They, they're, they're a mis, they represent a mismatch between my inner cognitive space, my laboratory and yours. And if we don't have the same stuff in there, if we don't see things the same way and we don't attach words to them the same way, then there'll be this, these kinds of disruptions. And again, this happens in all kinds of communication. I encountered a lot of this a couple of years ago when I was in the States and I was talking to people about upcoming elections. And, and um, I, I kept finding that, that you know, uh, so, so sorry, I lost my place for a second. Um, ghosts, they arise, the reason they ar arise is because there's a mismatch between a reader and writer's basic knowledge of facts, but also much more, they can result from differences in the way our brains work or cognitive organization. So a, children sees, a child sees space differently than an adult. And so you can, if you're trying to build a building based on a drawing, then you'll have differences. Um, they can also arise just because we don't, the goals of communicating with each other aren't the same or different styles of communication. They can also be due to the fact that we understand things using different patterns, models, or metaphors. And we'll talk a lot about the, these things um, later, especially if, if you're taking one of the practical courses. They can also have to do with the way that we pack and unpack information. And again, I'll talk about that. And of course, if our mental health is different, our states of mental health are different, we can also have communication problems because things don't mean the same thing simply again because our minds are organized differently or they work differently and there are a lot more types and i keep finding new ones um and they disrupt all kinds of communication as i said um i kept hearing people saying things like i voted for donald trump because he's going to make america great again and that meant something to people it didn't mean something to me and when i tried to analyze it i got into this naughty mess of of what things mean and what patterns and what concepts and what assumptions people have behind that. And I tried to map it out, but it got uncomfortable and unpleasant. There's a difference though in science because science treats meaning in really specific ways that you actually can decode and uncover. And there's lots of implications. So, so um, in, when I was when I began system when I had this concept and I began analyzing the kinds of mistakes I found or the kinds of problems I was seeing, I discovered that the most crucial issues with ghosts have to do with scientific models, what we call scientific models. And scientific models are all kinds of things. They're things like uh, we have models of what cells are like. We have models of evolution we have we different there's difference we have models of what a disease is of what causes disease of how a virus causes the disease and not agreeing on those models or not being clear about how those models work can really disrupt communication and it's a major factor in communication between experts and non-experts because most things in science take their meaning from these models. And if the person you're talking to doesn't know the models, then you're gonna be lost fairly quickly. Ghosts can also disrupt research because this inner laboratory we have, we can't see it all. It has 
hidden parts of it. Things like it probably didn't occur to you if you were to draw your house that you had this rule in your head that one wall is the back of the wall next door. It's just something that adults know, but you won't actively think about it. And that's fine when you're talking about a house, but if you're talking about science and there's something like that in there, it means there's an assumption that you're maybe not aware of and that can affect how you see a system. So um, if you think that there's four types of molecules and there's actually 12, that's gonna affect how you interpret data and study a system. So those can be assumptions over simplifications. They can be flaws in the model themselves and models are all flawed in some way or another because they're simplified versions of, and they're artificial and so on. But in any case, the main thing is, is that the only way to really see that organization and to see how these models work and how meaning works is to communicate it. And I'm going to give you an example of a case where a hidden system of thinking or a hidden pattern of thinking became really disruptive in a, in a research project. Now, ghosts can be infectious. That means if, if I learn to do something or if I learn a certain way of thinking about things in one context, I may apply it to a different context without knowing it, and that could cause some issues. So for example, I'm gonna show you a picture. I'm gonna show you two pictures of the same thing. And um, sorry, once again, um, <laughs> I've lost my place. Let, let me, I'll, I'll come back to that. So here's a case where if you, these, these are two images of the same thing, and I simply blurred this one. And if you see this image, your brain will try to interpret it and try to recognize the pattern. And your brain will then hopefully, I mean, you can say that these two things represent the same image. And if later, if I only showed you one of these and later asked you about it, you might not even know which one you'd seen because you'd say, okay, I saw this cat and it was kind of walking a certain way or poised in a certain way. It was a black and white image. Because we, we learn to interpret black and white images in a certain way. So I'm going to show you now something that you all will probably see slightly differently. And it's, it's also a black and white image with grayscale. Um, and that's this. So this is an MRI scan of a person's brain. And these images are black and white with a grayscale, sorry. And um, when we look at this, we, we look at this using brains that have been trained to interpret grayscale images in a certain way. We've been trained on images like this, okay? And so when we look at this, we say, okay, there's a white part and there's a black part and there's a gray part and that's probably a structure. And so you can see the structure and you can guess there's an outline. You can guess, okay, that's an outline. It looks kind of like a cat and this looks like a leg. Well, what happens if you do the same thing with something that you haven't directly seen, but something that's produced by a scientific instrument? Well, you'll say, okay, there's this kind of white thing here and that's probably a connected structure. And there's a white thing here, a whitish thing. And it's also probably a single connected structure. And then there's this part, this also is connected. Again, you're looking at the brain kind of like you looked at a cat in terms of seeing structures, interpreting what's connected to each other, what's maybe a functional unit or whatever. Now, in doing this, our brain simplifies it because you can see lots of information, but if you had to draw it or whatever, you wouldn't remember probably all of that. And you might draw it something like this, where we've kind of lumped the grayish whitish things together and the darker parts together. And so we'd say, okay, this is a simplified version of the brain structure, but, but is it really? Because in fact, in this image, there's a lot more information than that. And um, in this image, if, if, if you false colorize it, if you say, okay, there's lots of scales of gray and I don't really see them or I don't interpret them as important, but I could see them if, the computer just 
showed me them in different colors. So what I did was I false colorized this image and this is what I got. So all I did was I fished out pixels of that other image and I said, okay, even though they're, they're very similar shades of gray, they're slightly different. So I'm gonna make them really different just so I can see. And so I, I made this image, I showed it to the scientist and he said, oh my gosh, you know, look at all that structure in there. Those are substructures. And maybe this white thing isn't only one thing. Maybe it's got separate parts and maybe they're smaller components that, or, or finer gradients we haven't seen. And actually this changed how they were starting to analyze and look at these images, just doing this exercise because it showed them that there's a lot more information and they, they knew this obviously, but it was hard to say how much of it was meaningful. And so you see that there are all kinds of substructures. And if you've been trained to look at a thing one way, and then suddenly you look at a piece of science using that other training, it may not work out. And the only way to make people aware of this was actually to take this image, which is a piece of communication and force it into a form that would reveal the, the hidden parts of it. So again, what we're talking about is how communication exposes hidden ghosts. And, and what's really interesting about this is that the ghosts, since ghosts represent a mismatch between the way I think and the way you think, then if I talk to different kinds of audiences, then different ghosts are gonna happen. And that's a really interesting process that we're going to that has implications for research and we're going to talk about that now before we do um i'm going to show you one more thing one more metaphor sort of of this process and i'm going to show you something that will automatically each of us will see slightly differently um in some cases really differently and again what you see what it means depends on invisible things. And the best example I can think of that is this. So if, if I show you this image, we're all seeing the same visual image, but our brains automatically see more than just the image. And um, if you're a chess player, this will look really different to you than if you're not a chess player. And if you're a really good chess player, then this will also look different to you than if you're a really mediocre chess player like I am. Um, we're, again, we're seeing the same thing, but a chess player has a mental model of the game in his head or her head, which, and this mental model tells us several things. It describes what the pieces of a chess set are. It describes the rules by which they move. And it also describes a little bit more like the behavior of players. You have to know that in a game, the person with the white pieces moves first, then the person with the black pieces, always, always, they're always an alternation. And you have to know that the goal of the game is to capture the other king, but that never actually happens because the game always stops right before it could happen. Um, so this model describes different things and it permits, if, if, you, if you understand the model, then you can pose certain questions with it. You can say, for example, um, um, you can say, is, this, is it possible that this situation occurred during a real game? Maybe it's not, maybe there's too many pieces on the board. Maybe there's extra pieces. Maybe there's something wrong with the board. Um, you can also project forward and backwards. You can say, what, what just happened? And a lot of times these are printed in newspapers and the question is, okay, um, white or black will checkmate white in three moves. What are those moves, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of things that you can do here with this if you understand the model and the game. Okay, so, but if you don't, then this will be quite mysterious to you. And looking at this is quite a lot like looking at a piece of science. And this is really interesting because there are chess players 
that learns to play that that are so good at the game that they can play chess without a board so they can just kind of call out the squares and the moves and they have a model in their mind and they're watching this and the other person will move and then give an answer but i think they all started with a real board because before you internalize that and really do it you need to actually do it physically and work it out so if we take this metaphor back to science then what it's trying to tell us is that this is a this board is a piece of communication it's a, it's a place to work things out and so communication is like the game board of science if if you don't have a text or a talk or a paper or whatever then i'm not sure what science is it's 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 an abstract game or it's an abstract set of concepts but it's 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 a playing field so communication is is like the board of science. A paper is like a, a game, a, a chess game. It's the board that you play science on. It's the place where you apply the rules and the models and you fight over them and negotiate over them. So again, communication is a game. It's, it's, it's the way that we come to an agreement or, an, or we disagree and discuss the differences or the similarities in our inner laboratory. So imagine what science would be like without those things. Imagine, and, and this is really interesting because there's no place where you can go to, you can find books of chess, which have all the rules and all the, a lot of strategies, but, but you can actually go to a place and you can find a book that tells you what the rules of chess are, what the model of chess is. How you play it is a different question, but we don't have that for science. In science, we have models that are, first of all, they're simplified and they're abstract representations of systems like cells or um, atoms or the universe or an ecosphere or cancer but those models, there's not, they, they don't exist where we make them and they're dynamic and we're constantly updating them in the reviews and the literature. There's no single place where you can go to say, I want to understand the perfect model for a tumor or a tumor cell. I need to go to the latest literature and see what people think nowadays. And the other thing that's important is although there's writing about those systems and there's drawings and there's schemes, the real model is in a scientist's head and each scientist constructs an individual version and understands it in an individual way. And I think that's incredibly important because the way that those are constructed is always gonna be a little bit different. And that gives kind of an energy. It's like variation in evolution or whatever. It gives an energy, which means that people are gonna to try to approach questions and, and solve problems in slightly different ways. And it, it causes conflicts, which are how games are played and how things are resolved. So every experiment that you do and all the data you collect it, it, it takes on its entire meaning and, and the questions you're asking, they take on their meaning because they're connected to these inner models. And if you want to know how a model works, what it means, if you want to promote your interpretation of data, you not only have to show it to somebody, but you have to pack it, unpack it and use it in some similar way. So let me show you some things about this packing and packing and using what you're kind of so i'm going to show you basically what i'm going to try to show you now is the fact that scientists might have highly similar models for things and their inner laboratories might be um, uh, organized in pretty similar ways but they're still going to play the game of chess a little bit differently and i'm going to do that by going all the way back to this text that we had before where we, again, we're gonna go back to Beta Katinin and this game is full of all kinds of unspoken agreements and assumptions and that you only discover when you try to communicate them. So cells constantly produce and degrade the molecule Beta Katinin. Normally it's bound to a complex that's targeted for destruction. 
Signaling by wind blocks the formation of this complex, leaving higher quantities of beta catenin that can enter the nucleus and activate target genes. So when I saw this, I asked, I immediately asked the scientist, cells, what type of cell are you talking about? Is it a blood cell? Is it a muscle cell? Is it a brain cell? What species is it in? And he looked at me and he said, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> For this case, it doesn't really matter. He's actually studying cancer and a certain type of cancer cell, but this signaling pathway, there's certain sort of fundamental aspects of it that are kind of universal. So he hadn't even thought about the question of what type of cell it is. Should you think about it? Is it important? I don't know. And when I asked him that question, he also kind of looked up and he said, maybe it's important. Maybe I need to explain that. But you'll find this a lot of times in the literature, there's something that's just not fully explained. And it's okay because people know what he meant and they will unpack it. He packed it, he packed this idea of this cell in the system into language in a certain way, and they will unpack it hopefully in a similar way. The word produce is lots and lots of steps of things that only happen under certain conditions. And again, it's a very simplified word uh, to represent something really complicated. Degrade is also the same. And then he says molecule beta catenin. What, what kind of molecules are you talking about? There are all kinds of, there's, there's DNA, RNA, proteins. And in fact, the word beta catenin is used to talk about all three and they're related to each other. Which one is he? Well, here he's talking about a protein, but you have to know that. And he would know that and the person who read it would know that. But then there's an issue that this molecule beta catenin, it's possible that every single person in the world has a slightly different version of it with just maybe one little spelling difference. And different types of cells have different versions of it. They have shorter versions, they cut out pieces or they have longer versions. Which one are we talking about? Again, does it matter in this context? He, it didn't concern him. <clears throat> then we have this thing called complex and complexes are really complex in biology. They're complicated because there are these clusters of molecules that stick to each other to do things as a big machine. But a lot of times we don't know all the pieces of that machine. We don't know which are the most important ones and so on and so we, and, and even if we do know all the pieces, we, we can't see actually physically how they're arranged to each other. Do any of these things matter under what conditions? Well, they only matter under certain conditions that hopefully people agree on. And in fact, people may not agree. And people may not agree what this text means, not because of what's here, but because of the way that they're relating it to this invisible knowledge, because the way they're unpacking it, because of the way they answer all of these types of questions for themselves. And then there's the issue of all of these things are based on models. What if those models are wrong? Okay. Let me, let me summarize. There's not a lot more that I'm gonna show you except for a couple of really interesting examples. But let me, let me summarize this a little bit by reminding us that what we're talking about is we're talking about communication as a way of giving us a view of this inner laboratory where the magic of science really happens. But that laboratory is invisible. Without communication, you can't really see what's in there or how it's organized. And I will maintain that you can't even see how your own inner laboratory is organized um, without communicating it to yourself or to other people. I think to communicate science well, you have to really be acquainted with and familiar with your inner laboratory. And this is one of those things I think that is really interesting about Nobel Prize winners. I think they're, for the most part, or great scientists are extremely aware of how they use models, how their knowledge is organized, how things are related in their heads. And when they read a piece of science, they're automatically understanding these connections and relating them. Now, to do this well, to communicate it well, you not only have to be familiar, well familiar with your own patterns and, and mental organization, but you also have to make a bunch of guesses about the way, the, what your audience knows and how their knowledge is organized. Not just what facts they know, because because the question is, what are we trying to achieve? So what's the goal of a talk or a text? What are we truly trying to communicate? And 
let's and if we wanted to do this scientifically we would need we would need to have some kind of test that we can perform to measure whether we've succeeded or not now the test that i propose i mean i'm going to show you an example of how this works but but let's let's just look at this i i don't think the goal is to get you to memorize something like Curran's goal when he was talking about AIDS was not to get people to be able to recite exactly what he said as a quote. His goal was to get people to understand what he means so that they could convey that meaning. And that means you have to understand, you're not just memorizing something. You're just not submitting a list of facts to memory. You're, you're trying to grasp something. You're trying to really understand it. And one test of whether you have is that if you really understand something, then there's lots of different ways to say the same thing usually, and they're all correct. And there are a lot of ways that are not correct, but if you've understood it, you should be able to pick different ways to say the same thing that are correct. Then also you should be able to use them. And we'll talk a little bit about that means, what that means. So th the key thing is it's gonna be, it's gonna turn out to be more important to reproduce the pattern of a set of ideas than to reproduce any specific set of statements or facts. Now, to look at this in, in detail, I'm gonna give you an example, and this is another real life example. This comes from a press release about a story about cells. And I'm gonna, let me, let's just go through the press release and then we'll deconstruct it a little bit. A press release at that time, the idea was to take a piece of science that had been published in an important journal and to write a version of that story that was popular in the sense that a normal non-scientist, an educated person who was reading a newspaper or looking at a website could read that and understand the idea, understand what the scientist had discovered and understand what it means. That was, again, my goal was as a, my own goal as a science writer was always to tell the scientist story and, and to tell what it meant to the scientist. And to do this in a press release, you need to do it in a way that people who are not scientists will understand. And so the idea was they would send this off to a newspaper and people would read it and they would get the point. Well, let's have a look at the example. And this is not from me, this is from a, a, another institute. So the title of the article was Rewrite the Textbooks, Transcription is Bidirectional. And we're just gonna plunge right into this. This is how they wrote the text. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms that are easier to study than humans. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have a, come a step closer to understanding their function. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the site, start sites of transcription, contradicting the established notion that they support transcription in one direction only. The results are also representative of transcription in humans. Now, if you were a scientist, th this is like the chessboard. A chess player sees the chessboard differently than somebody who has never played a game and has never studied the rules. And a scientist will read this text, a biologist will read this text differently than somebody who's never studied biology or doesn't remember a lot of whatever they had in school. And so we're gonna break this down and we're gonna start by just asking ourselves a really simple couple of questions. And that is, what does each sentence mean? And then what connects that sentence to the next sentence? And in some cases, we're gonna see that something is missing and we're gonna to try to figure out what that is. So if you read the first sentence, genes that constrain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. That means something, I guess. Now we'll read the next sentence. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. 
what's the connection between these two sentences? What, what, how will you put those two pieces of information together? Well, let's go on here. The same is true for many other organisms. Okay, whatever that means. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have come a step closer to understand their function. What's a transcript? Well, up here we use the word transcribed. And so maybe I can think something that is transcribed could possibly be a transcript. So maybe that means an RNA. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the start sites of transcription. What's transcription? Okay, well, there's transcribed and transcript, but what's the start site? Um, what, what the start site, is that an RNA molecule or what? Contradicting these. So there's just many, many things in here that are, you're going to, to understand what this means in the way that the scientist and the press officer intended. There's lots of things that you're gonna to have to figure out, okay? And so again, a scientist can figure this all out because this is all related to something called gene expression. And a biologist has a map, a, a, a living dynamic model of gene expression in their heads. And there's a way to kind of diagram these things. So I made a diagram of my own model of gene expression, which is not great and it's not complete. I just sat down and I used a little tool that I'll, I'll give you the link to later to draw this, it's a really easy tool to use. And so I drew this and, and put it together. And this is everything I knew about how information in genes is used to produce other kinds of molecules. And so this is my map. And if a different, if a scientist were to draw this, they would draw a different map. And, and each person would probably draw a little bit differently and they would include different details. This again, this is only, this is a selection of what I know. and it's my best attempt to kind of link it all together. And each scientist's version of this is different. And how I made this is I just asked myself, okay, what are the parts of the system and how are they connected to each other in my head? So this is a, a visual view of part of my inner laboratory, such as it is. And again, all scientists don't all have the same framework because they, they've built it themselves. I'd put this all together myself by learning single pieces of it and then assembling them into a structure. And each scientist has done this in different ways. And also they've packed and unpacked things in different ways. And so when a scientist reads this text, they look at the parts and they put them in, they, they see where those parts fit into an existing map and they see how they're related to each other. And so the meaning of what they read is by mapping that text onto this hidden ghost-like model structure. If you don't have, it's, it's a process that psychologists that, that Jean Piaget, the famous developmental psychologist calls this assimilation. And that is you take information and you plug it into an existing structure and scientists will have some kind of structure. And of course, you may learn something new, in fact, there is one piece of new information in this text. And so you, it may juggle or adjust the model. And every text that you read is potentially, it adds something or it slightly alters the way that you see these things or so on and so on. Um, if you don't have this, then what you're doing when you're reading this text is you're trying to build such a map. And if you read this text, the way that you'll build it is the following way. Genes that contain instructions, I think, contain instructions for making proteins make up less than human 2% of the human genome. So you'll say genes encode proteins and they're a small part of the genome. And then most, you'll learn also that most are transcribed into RNA. That's what you'll learn in the next sentence. And then you'll learn that yeast generates transcripts, it has functions, and then you'll learn that promoters are the start sites of transcription. We previously believe that to happen in one direction and now that's been contradicted. So either 
you're building a new map and this is kind of what it's looked like. This is what it look, looks like, will look like based on the text. And any text that I read, if I can pretend like I'm gonna build the information into a structure and that's what I would get. Um, you're either doing that or you're fitting it into some other structure that you have and you might do that in bizarre ways. Now, what's the alternative? I mean, does the scientist have to give you this so that you can understand this? Do you have to know all of this to make any sense out of this? I don't think so, because, because remember the goal. The goal is not to get you to learn a whole system because that system, we, we may not agree on it anyway. The, the goal is to give you the meaning of something. And so what you need to do is go through a process. And the first thing is, is you want to get the clearest possible view of the story and the structure of the idea. So what concepts do we need? We're gonna to need to talk about transcripts. We're gonna to need to talk about RNAs. We're gonna to need to talk about transcription and maybe make a map of that. And then the other thing that you do, and, and the other thing you need to do is you need to focus on the central question that's being asked and what that question means. And again, in science, what things mean is determined by the models that it relates to. And the next step is to make a smart guess about what your target audience already knows. And the final step is to find the simplest way to help people build a map out of the patterns that you're introducing. So you need to keep it simple. You still wanna tell the story, but you need to keep it simple. And then you need to see if there's some way to use what they already know to, to draw on this, this knowledge. And, and so this is the process. And this process is crucial to every type of science communication. A lot of times people don't do it. And a lot of times it goes wrong because at some step in this process, the scientist didn't do this or the person who's talking about science didn't do this. And if, if you're trying to understand a piece of science, you can kind of do it backwards. You have to understand that you're trying to build a structure. You have to relate that structure to the things you're doing in your head and, and so on and so on. So if, if you know that this is an important process, you can use it for all kinds of things. So we're gonna do this now together. We're gonna go back to this text this transcription is bi-directional and we're gonna analyze it and we're gonna figure out what concepts you need to explain the story. And then we're gonna figure out how to focus and find the pattern. So the first thing we're gonna do, and this is crucial, crucial step in just about every type of science communication that I've ever encountered is it's very helpful to articulate the theme of the work as an extremely precise question. That is, a, a project usually answers a question. Now, it may not be the question you wanted to answer or that you started out to answer three years ago, but at the end, if you're gonna publish something, you're gonna present something, you're gonna write a press release about something, you found something and it's the answer to a question. So the first thing is, is to know as clearly as possible what that question is. And then you need to define what the question means. And, and so I'm going to tell you what the question is. And then we have to, to understand why I'm asking that question and to put it into perspective. There's other things we have to know, and those have to do with models. So we have a model of a system, and that model helps us ask some questions. And the model is the reason why we're asking the question. And the answer tells us something about the model. So anyway. I'll show you how this works, but but this is really important. So so let's let's go back and look at this question that we this this text that we asked, and let's do these things, and, and I'll show you what happens. So what's the theme of that work? So the theme of that project was what can we learn about the way this thing called the transcription machinery in cells works if we look at the sequences of all the RNAs it produces. Now, that's not a public friendly question. It's not, it's not intended for 
a press release. It's not, it's simply the clearest scientific articulation I can make of the question. It's very scientific and that's fine because it's just a starting place, okay? But it, it, the question is not how do cells make molecules? That's too vague. The question is not um, how does the trans transcription machinery work. That's too vague. The question is, what do we learn about the operation of the transcription machinery by studying RNAs? And again, I could, I could phrase this question in a dozen ways. It would all be right, as long as they capture that central idea. Now, it's important to note that this question is a specific form of more general things. And we'll get back to that later. I'm not going to talk about that now. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to find what the question means. We need to relate it to models and we need to figure out what the answer says about those models. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but how are projects, I've told you all over and over again that these questions and these and, and meaning in science, the meaning of a piece of data or the meaning of, of a, a study is related to models. And there's different ways that they may be related. So for example, you may be modeling a new system. I'm, I'm gonna give you a scientific example and we'll use chess as an example. Okay, so if you don't know how chess works, you can watch a bunch of people play games and you can start to figure out, okay, what are the pieces and how do they interact with each other? What are the rules that determine which ways they move and what their rules? In a scientific system, it's like, okay, so I have a new, recently, uh, just last week, scientists just study, study, found some kind of mud balls in California that have weird Bork-like Star Trek DNA in them somehow. So if you find this new thing, you're gonna say, okay, um, um, what, are, what are the components of it? What kinds of DNA do they have in it? Where did that DNA come from? Um, what can we find out about these clusters of DNA by looking at these mud balls? Okay, so you may be, Another type of relationship between a project and a model is you may be trying to improve or replace or challenge a model. So uh, if, if you think that transcription happens in a certain way, transcription always works in one direction. Uh, there's this thing called the transcription machine. It starts at the beginning and it goes in one direction to the end and produces an RNA molecule. Well, is that true? Maybe we can find out. So the model predicts then that all RNAs would be in a certain sequence. What happens if we find ones in a different sequence? And this has happened many times. Um, so if, I, if I've if i made a model of my chess game now, um, I predict that a pawn can only move forwards. What happens if I see it moving diagonally? Oh, okay, I, suddenly that happens in a game. I need to revise my model. Um, I may be, I may have, I, I may be looking at a system and I found some new components, like there's certain kinds of RNA molecules. Well, what happens if I find a new one? Um, let's see how that fits into this, into the other cells, the other molecules inside cells. I may be extending an existing model to a new system. Like, so um, I, I want to understand this bizarre creature called the platypus, and I want to know if it evolved um, according to. Uh, the principles that we under, of evolution we understand. I, I look at an eye and I think, oh my, that's very complex. Could, it, could evolution explain how it evolved? Or you may be integrating a model into a more general one. So you can say, okay, so I understand now how chess is played. What does that tell me about how other games are played? Or is it like other games? Or, um, or you could be saying, okay, now we've suddenly discovered a new science of genetics. Can we fit that together with the theory of evolution, which was proposed a bunch of years ago? These are most of the types of relationships between specific scientific projects and models. And if the question that you're asking is unclear, or if the relationship of that question to models are unclear, I'm telling this to the scientists now, it's gonna be really hard to actually know what the meaning of the thing is and what you're trying to communicate. So those, those two things have to be clear. So let's go back to our transcriptions bidirectional and let's, here's my model of gene expression, my big complicated one. But actually to explain the story, to explain the meaning of this story and its relationship to models, I don't need to talk about all those pieces. I only need to say, okay, we're gonna talk about 
this thing that cells have, which is called the transcription machinery. And it binds to DNA sequences. If you want, you can say it binds to particular parts called promoters. And it reads those sequences in one direction and it transcribes them into RNA sequences. So it, it takes, it reads DNA and it writes an RNA molecule, letter by letter. It looks DNA, RNA, DNA, RNA, until it builds from the string of letters in the DNA, it builds a new string of letters in the RNA. And people used to thought think that it did that in one direction, but now if we look at the RNA sequences and compare them to DNA sequences, we find that the machine can read and write in two directions. And that's really interesting. So I've told that in a kind of scientific way, but that's the pattern that I want people to remember. I, the new thing is, is that this basic machine in cells that does something really important works in a new way that we didn't know before. Now, how do we turn that into a press release or a piece of successful communication? Well, there's basically, after we've done this analysis and, and we've focused the story down to its kind of most minimal components, then there's basically three things we try to do. We, we see if we can't put this pattern of ideas we have into a familiar pattern that people already know. I mean, either we have to teach them how all these things, what all these things are and how they're related to each other. Again, it's not that many, but still. Or maybe we can use something that they already know to, to do this. Then we need to find the right level of information and right level of discourse, right style to talk to people on. And then, we'd like to get them interested in the story. So again, if, if we were gonna go into a bar and pick up somebody using the story, you wouldn't start by saying, um, um, genes, oh, let me find the story again. Yes, uh, genes that contain instruction for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. I mean, it's an interesting fact. It's a fun fact maybe, but it's not a good pickup line. And was what we're looking for in a story is a pickup line of some kind. Sorry, I hope that's not inappropriate. Anyway, so let's see if we can find a familiar pattern. And actually, if you look at these words, there's certain things in it that are familiar words to people. There's machine, there's the word transcription, which is also a concept. Transcribe means to write something down that you've heard or read somewhere else. Um, we have this idea of a kind of a text, the DNA sequences. A sequence means a, a, a row in a certain order, like, like the words in a text or the letters in a, in a word that mean something in a certain order. And then we have um, this concept of directionality. So let's see, if, let's, let's rephrase that and, and use this metaphor we have a machine that does different things. It binds to DNA. It reads the DNA. It transcribes the DNA and it kind of understands it. And, and normally when we're talking about text reading and transcribing, these things happen in one direction like English. Uh, but what they've discovered is that it's not one directional, it's two directional. So let's try to put this now into a story and see what happens. And let's try to find a pickup line, a pickup line, huh? Why is this important? Why is it interesting? Because we've discovered something really, really, really in interesting and important about our cells and about life, in fact. So here's a different version. And again, this is not the only version. It's not the best version. It's just a version that tries to do those things. Our DNA can be read backwards and forwards. And that's a catchy title, but it also captures pretty much the central idea. Um, and now I'm gonna try to engage the public by telling them why they should care about all of this. So our cells specialize and cope with challenges of life by producing different sets of molecules. They do this by drawing on different recipes in their DNA that they use to build RNAs and then proteins. This process begins when a cellular machine scans DNA and locates the instructions it needs for a particular molecule. The machine attaches itself at the beginning of that piece of code, reads it, and transcribes it letter by letter into an RNA molecule. 
Until now, scientists have thought that the recipes only made sense when read and transcribed in one direction, like this text. But scientists at Embel have now found that when it binds to DNA, the machine can often read and transcribe in both directions. I've told the whole story that it was told in the press release in a slightly different way. And now I can even do more. I can go on and I can talk a little bit about how this was really done. The team discovered this while examining the entire set of RNAs that cells made. They found cases of molecules spelled forwards and backwards, starting from the same position. And when they looked closer, they found this backward and forward transcription seems to happen for most DNA sequences in humans, other animals, and many other organisms. This means that, and it raised some interesting questions. So I've told the story, I've used familiar patterns, a metaphor, so let's look at this again, let's analyze it. Again, I want to engage them. So why is it relevant to anything or interesting? Well, because it, it's related to an aspect of our lives. It's related to our health. It's related to whatever. Um, the familiar patterns involve texts and machines and scans and instructions and recipes. Those are all things that people are familiar with. And while technically the chemistry and the biochemical details of these processes are different, are, are more precise and, and more technical, the basic concept is still there. Um, I really, I want to tell in the clearest possible way what the scientists actually found. And I also want to give people a sense of what this means to scientists. What are the implications? What do we know? What can we do that wasn't possible before? Um, and there's different conclusions that you can draw from this. So you can, you can say, okay, well, imagine I have a recipe book and now I suddenly discover that recipes make sense not only when you read them from forward, from left to right, but from right to left. That means the recipe book has twice as many recipes in it probably. And that's important, that's interesting. Um, um, people also ask an interesting question. So, so if the machine binds and it can read left and right, well, imagine I'm trying to read and I can read in both directions. How do I decide when I, when I go into a book and I look at a particular passage, how do I decide whether to, to read to the left or right. And that's an interesting scientific question that is perfectly valid and interesting to ask based on this study. And you don't need to know any science to be able to ask that interesting question. That's pretty fascinating that without, ask, without really knowing anything about the science, you can understand a story in a way that permits you to ask an important, interesting question. I think that would be a good goal for communication. So that means I've really integrated it and I've, I can recover it, I can reproduce it, and I can also ask questions about it. Um, so this is a text for people outside the field. And, and again, it, I, I wrote this text because I went through a process in which I first focused on the question and then I looked at the pattern and then I looked at the concepts I needed and then I try to find the clearest way to give somebody the structure. Again, I don't care if people can repeat any words that I use, but I want them to go away being able to tell the story. And okay, so that's an interesting process. And again, this is also a useful process if you're writing for other scientists, because I've seen thousands of letters that people have written to editors trying to pitch the papers that they're sending in, trying to explain to the editor why nature or science or cell or the Journal of Theoretical Physics should print their paper. And if they don't fill these functions explaining what the question you're trying to answer is, why that question is relevant or interesting, and what the question means in terms of our current thinking in a field and the models that we have, they will get published. So why is this process important? In so, so how do we find the right level to talk to people? This, this is interesting. So let, let me break this down in a slightly different way. And I just, wanted, I just wanted to show you like two or three more things. And then finally, this first session will be over. But, but again, this process is crucial. So 
why is this important for communication? And why is it important for research? I'm, I, my, my thesis the whole time has been that, that doing this a certain way has implications. It'll not only help us communicate things in a, in a much clearer and simpler way, and it'll make it easier to do that, um, but it will also help our research. And I'm gonna try to show you that, and I'm gonna try to bring all this back to our question about what makes a Nobel Prize winner so special. So, and, and to do that, I'm gonna go back to a real specific question that we asked, uh, that, a, that a friend of mine asked. So remember the story at the beginning about Wint and beta catenin and, and the one that we talked, where we talked about packing and unpacking and whether it's important, what kind of cells are involved. The, the, the question one student was asking about was, here's the very specific scientific question that they were asking for their thesis. And that is, what is the structural basis? That means the physical and chemical basis by which beta catenin binds to DNA molecules in order to activate genes. Now, that's the question. I'm gonna show you specifically what that means. And then I'm gonna show you generally what that means. And then I'm gonna show you why this process of analysis is so important in both communication and science. Okay, so I'm, here, this pulls it all together. Here's our question. And what the scientist means is they're, they're trying to figure out what the, the physical characteristics of this molecule are that allow it to have a chemical interaction with DNA that allows it to bind there and do things. What it does is it starts this transcription machinery process. Anyway, so what, what are the protein structure elements that permit it to bind to DNA? What other molecules need to be there linked to it in order for it to do that? When it links to those other molecules, do they cause some kind of change of conformation or shape that influences how it binds to DNA? Because all of those things may happen in a way that's really specific to a certain type of tissue or a cancer cell or whatever. And if we could understand this, then we might be able to answer lots of other questions, okay? Because this beta catenin, it's everywhere, it's in all different kinds of cells, but it does all kinds of different things at different times. And what we're trying to figure out is why this one molecule can do so many things, why it can tell this type of cell to activate a certain molecule, to activate a certain gene, why it tells a different kind of cell to activate a different set of genes, and it does so based on all this stuff, and that's what the paper's about. Okay, that was the scientific side of this. And if I were going to give this talk at a scientific conference, that's how I would talk about it. But during the course, the, the, the student's goal was also to, um, to, to be able to explain her work to her grandparents who were really interested. And she tried several times, you know, they said, oh, you know, we're helping pay for your university education. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? And she tried to explain this and it turned out to be very complicated. So here's what you can do. And what you have to realize is that the reason why we're asking these questions and the specific questions we ask are specific forms of much more general questions that are more interesting or more important sometimes. So for example, beta catenin is what we call a transcription factor. And a transcription factor is a molecule that goes into the nucleus and tells the cell which genes to activate. And that's really important in all kinds of processes. It's important as cells specialize into different types. It's important when they adapt to stress or environmental changes. And it's also important if the cell is diseased somehow, those transcription factors, their activity can be altered and they can activate the wrong genes, produce the wrong molecules with all kinds of bad consequences. Now, this process of specialization is something we all know about because we all know that we all start off as a single cell, a fertilized egg in our, our mothers. And we develop from that one cell, we develop all these weird different types of cells that you've seen in pictures. You've seen pictures of nerve cells. They look like big trees with all these roots and a big long 
brand, uh, trunk and then and then the the axon and then the top and then you've seen pictures of red blood cells which look like little donuts and white blood cells which are these scavenger types you you see that they look all really different and the reason they look different is because um because of these processes of acting being different genes so all i've done is i've linked now this topic to much much more general themes and this has two functions the the first is while i'm working on this specific question i'm also working on more general questions so of course i'm working i'm interested in beta catenin but what i learn may not only tell me about beta catenin but it may tell me something about transcription factors in general and it may tell me something about how cells decide which genes to activate in general and it may tell me something about what happens in cancer cells in general and so I'm working on a specific problem, but first of all, the reason why I'm working on it is because this molecule is really interesting in all these different kinds of contexts. And secondly, because if I can answer the question, I may have learned a lot more things. And in a paper, you start in the introduction by introducing this question that you're asking. And in the discussion, you're gonna go into what it means in terms of all these other things. So that's the scientific part of it. and. A lot of Nobel Prizes have been won by people who are working on this level of a very specific question. But I think what's different or what's special about the way those people think is they're highly aware of the fact that this real specific question is a part of much, much more general issues. And they have found one point in the whole tree that they can grab and shake, and if they can answer that question, they're shaking the whole tree, they're finding out something really fundamental and basic about much more general processes, about diseases, or about specialization of cells, or whatever. So that's the scientific importance, and again, when you go into your discussion of your paper or your thesis, then you're gonna say, okay, I have learned this specific thing, but this tells me something about cancer, it tells me something about development, whatever. This also gives you a path to talk to all kinds of different audiences because, and I'll show you how this works, okay? So again, I wanna tell my grandparents this. And so I go up to him and I say, you know, grandma, we all start as one cell, you know, sperm and egg, they get together and they fuse and, and, and you have this one cell and then it starts to divide, but over time, all those cells become different. And the reason they, look different and they build this huge body and, and they have all these specialized tasks is because they all have the same recipe book, but each type of cell uses a different part of it to cook up stuff and to cook up molecules, yeah? And, and that explains the differences. And what I'm interested in is how each cell knows which recipes to read. And, it does that because it has these molecules in it called transcription factors. And they're not, a transcription factor is, is, a, is a recipe reading molecule and it's not specific. So you don't have one for every different recipe that you wanna cook. You know, it's like you have, you have some that are very multifunctional and they do this by teaming up with other molecules and then going into the nucleus where the recipes are stored in our DNA. And then they find the place where the recipe starts and they dock onto it and then they read it and then they produce these molecules. And what I'm trying to understand is how this one transcription factor, this recipe reader, connects up to those other molecules to make those kinds of de decisions. In, because when that goes wrong, it cooks the cooks up the wrong recipes and then you get cancer or you get... Okay, so in this little story that I've just told my fictional grandparents, I've gone from something they know, which is that one egg, fertilized egg, produces all the cells of our body to the real specific thing I'm interested in. And so this gives you a path from a general knowledge topic which is something we're all familiar with or interested in, how our health depends on the small stuff inside of us, cells and molecules.
and gets us down to the real specific. It gives us a path to get from that information. And it also, scientifically, it also shows you, okay, while I'm learning something about this, I may be learning something about all these other things. And if something goes wrong in my experiment, it may not be because of something that's wrong in our models or our assumptions or our procedures down here. It may be that I'm working on all these models and testing and, and probing all these models at the same time. We may be making a completely wrong assumption about how cells specialize and develop. And that kind of thing happened, for example, when people developed the idea of a cancer stem cell, one cancer cell that can then also specialize and differentiate into different types of tumor tissue being important targets for therapy and things like, again, there's all kinds of examples of this, but this shows a connection between the process of analyzing a topic for communication and the process of understanding it's important for research, which is one of my goals that I stated at the very beginning. Now, if we achieve this, if we really, really get people to understand a story like this in terms of reading recipes and producing texts, the metaphor that we've used is reading. And I only use that metaphor because I, I was talking to um, I was talking to the public. You know, if if I were talking to scientists, I, I don't need to talk about reading. I could stay with more sort of technical language like transcription or whatever. It's really important to realize that the concepts that scientists have in their heads are more specialized, like transcription to a scientist means something different than it means to me, okay? But again, that concept of transcription is not just a copy of reality. It's a concept, it's a model that that scientist has constructed. So it is a pattern, it is a metaphor, and understanding that it is has some implications because you can play with patterns and metaphors in the inner laboratory in ways that you can't play with real stuff in life. For example, let's go back to this idea. Transcription is like reading and writing. So in the, in the text about transcription is bidirectional, our cells can read DNA forwards and backwards. I use the metaphor of reading and writing and texts. So let's really think about reading and writing. What are some things that I do when I'm reading a book? Well, when I'm reading a book or a paper, I admit, if there's a passage that's really boring, sometimes I just skip over it. Sometimes if I don't understand a sentence, I go back and reread it. Sometimes if I think something is really important, I highlight it, I underline it, or I take notes while I'm reading, or I get a phone call and I stop to take it, or I mark my page. I do that, my wife hates it, but I bend the corners of the page. Um, or I can go back a few pages and reread something, or I can look something up. Now, that's how I read. And I was talking before about biology. So let's go back to the biological system. And since I use this metaphor of reading to talk to the public about transcription, I wonder if any of those other things I do when I read, I also do, the, the cell also does when it transcribes things. Does it skip boring passages? Does it, can it go back and reread a sentence if it isn't sure that the information is correct? Can it somehow alert the cell that a particular sequence is more important than others? I don't know, okay? These are, these are I'm, I'm trying to ask in a metaphorical way a scientific question. And usually when I do this, 80 or 90% of the problem of the questions are ridiculous or they don't make any sense. But every once in a while you'll hit on one that does make sense. And in fact, it may even be one that the scientist hasn't really thought of because they're immersed in their vision of how transcription works. And they don't really think they may they may not really step back and say, okay, um, what's the pattern like? How do I understand this pattern? Could I, could I play with this pattern and see, and this, this is where the inner laboratory is, is a creative space. It's a, it's a space where new science can happen because 
you can manipulate concepts and metaphors and patterns in ways that are difficult to do in a real laboratory. Now, another way, that, another game that you can play with this inner laboratory is I showed you this pattern that I had before of gene expression. And again, so, so what I did was, when, when I think about this, I can only think about little pieces at a time. And it's sometimes it's good to kind of try to see the whole. So I drew this map and then I printed it out on a big poster that I could put on the wall. And um, then I played a game with it. I took two darts from the Irish pub. I liberated them from the Irish pub. I took two of those darts and I threw them at the wall and they landed in just random places. Like one of them landed on alternative splicing, whatever that is, another landed on promoters. And normally there's no real reason for me to think of those two things as connected to each other because one of them is way over here and another of them is way over here. Um, but now that I had my two darts there, I, I said, okay, well, I wonder if there's any connection between promoters and alternative splicing. And if you go to the literature and look it up, you can actually find there's very, very interesting things that are happening now by connecting those two things, those co two concepts. And again, I thought of it simply because I had two darts. Other people, it took years of systematic concentrated work to wonder and lots of evidence and whatever. Well, maybe we could make it easier. Maybe we have this freedom to play with these patterns. If we really understand how they're in our laboratory, maybe we can use it to do experiments, thought experiments that we can do um, otherwise. Another thing you can do with this is once you see the this whole thing, you can say, okay, let's, this is a physical map of things. I wonder if this, 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 it's like a map where pieces are in certain places. I wonder if you drew a cell, a physical cell with like the nucleus and the cytoplasm and the membrane and everything. I wonder if this would map on, if you could just lay one over the other and say, okay, these things happen together are close together in my mind. So they're also close physically together in the cell. And I asked the scientist that and I started to look at this and I said, okay, well, alternative splicing, all this stuff happens in the nucleus. And he said, well, wait a minute. There's some evidence now that that can also happen in the cytoplasm in nerve cells, really interesting stuff. Again, only that question only came up because I was trying, I was looking at this as a game, as a pattern. I was taking my imaginary chessboard of science and trying out problems that may never occur in a real game, but you can learn things that way. You can also ask, did chunks of this all evolve at the same time? Or did like this piece and this piece evolve and then the parts in between evolved later? Again, I just thought of that now. I haven't thought of that before. So you can, this is endlessly possible. Okay. I have taken you now on a very long journey, sort of, and I want to I want to now try to summarize this. And and the point is simply that by becoming aware of this inner laboratory, how it works, how it's structured, and how it's important and related to what we're trying to communicate with different audiences, this this has all kinds of implications. One of the implications is it can affect the way that we talk to people or write about science. Another is it can affect the way that we think about our own work and the systems we're studying. And the other thing you can do is it, it, it makes it pretty easy to teach certain aspects of science communication or teach science in a way that has been, that may have been a little bit more difficult before because we've redefined sort of what we wanna teach. We, we're, we're not focused necessarily on teaching people a lot of facts that we want them to recite. We're showing them how a system is connected and, and, and what we're trying to achieve with the system and proposing strategies to achieve that. <coughs> so to summarize, um, communication is a tool to explore and expose hidden thinking in science, which we need to do in order to communicate it, but this can also improve research. Texts and talks and communication itself is a kind of game board. And its function is to be a place where scientists can compete or work out or work together or try to figure things out together. 
to work out how the models that they have in their minds operate and how they should be applied in specific cases to specific systems. Communicating science is not just delivering facts. It, to communicate the meaning of a scientific question or certain types of data, you need to relate it to other types of scientific concepts and models. And a lot of what we've done today is to, to show how there's a structure to doing that. We identify the question, we explain what the question means by referring to models and specific concepts. We make it as simple as possible by seeing that structure. Because the goal is to help the audience build a network of concepts that they can use and later they can recover that meaning. Um, to do all of this, again, what we want them to do is we want to be able to go, and I don't care what language they use, but they need to have grasped something. And what they have need to have grasped was this pattern, this set of connected ideas. And to accomplish all this, we have to see that a lot of the meaning in what we're trying to say comes or can be disrupted by these ghosts, which are hidden patterns that connect concepts and information in different ways. And again, there's all different types. And in the course, in the writing examples that we, where we do the practicals, I'll show you specifically where these kinds of things occur and, and how many different types there are. I found 14 types so far. I think there's a lot more. Ghosts are inherent to all communication. If they, as long as they stay invisible, they have completely unpredictable chaotic effects on thinking communication and even how we see things. So if, if I don't realize that I've been trained to look at black and white images by looking at pictures of cats, and now I'm looking at a brain scan, I may be looking at it the wrong way because of these invisible ghosts, the training and, and the coding that's gone into learning how to look at black and white images. The best way to expose these ghosts is to communicate with different audiences because each time it forces you maybe to come up with new metaphors to link them to patterns that different types of audiences are familiar with. And it, and it, and it requires that you apply new patterns to things that you're very familiar with. You just keep trying and trying until you find the right metaphor for the right audience. Um, and so um, this is how all of this comes together. And again, there's lots, lots, lots more to say. The, the kinds of patterns and the way that metaphors are used in science and scientific models is an absolutely crucial part of this. And there's a lot that I have done and there's a lot still to be done on this. The main thing is, is that this does, this system, this kind of model of how these two things are connected to each other is, has really powerful implications when we try to teach people, and when we try to understand the problems that students have and scientists have when they communicate, or even when I'm trying to understand a piece of science. If I'm reading something and I don't understand it, now I know it doesn't matter what kind of science it is, I know what I need to look for, I know where to go. And so it can make learning and communicating just a lot more efficient. So I will leave you now with a thank you to various people who have helped me along this path. Um, first of all, I work for the Forstand of the MDC and they've been very generous in letting me take time in order to work out these things. This has been years of work and a lot of presentations to a lot of different audiences. And so my colleagues also in the communications department, as long as I was in that department, were also very supportive. And there's a lot of scientists, I can't begin to name them all. Um, Friedrich Luft, Walter Birschmeier, Twelfth Niendorf, Miguel Andrade, Jochen Wittbold. Those are all people that I've encountered either at the MDC or in, in at Embo where I was before. And my dear beloved professor, James Hartman, who's still at the, who is an emeritus at the University of Kansas, has been extremely helpful in putting together the entire conceptual framework. And, sending me to the literature that I needed to read in order to even begin to grasp some of these problems and issues. Um, here's a few references. I run a blog, which is goodsciencewriting.wordpress.com. Um, there are two pieces, there are three main pieces on that site. Alongside this talk, which you probably found by visiting the blog, there are texts on this topic, which I read quite a while ago, and I'm revising now. 
There's a light introduction, which is a few pages, which kind of puts all this together. There's a much more intense theoretical version. And then there's a specific text about ghosts and scientific images. Also on that site, there's a lot of silly stuff like cartoons. Um, there's also some artwork. And the, the map tool that I used is a really interesting tool that is available for all kinds of platforms. And if you put this into Google, it's called CMAP tools. This concept and this sort of notion of teaching patterns and teaching maps goes back to a fantastic educator named Joe Nowak, who I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, 10 years ago in New York and really changed how I thought about teaching in life. Um, and the last two things are references uh, for, this is a sort of grammar book dictionary for non-native speakers, really helpful in writing. And this is the master on clarity and simplicity in writing. And I advise those works to everybody. So I'm hopeful that in the near future, there will be uh, some more videos on this site. I know this has been a long haul. Um, there'll be more videos on this site, which, which show how we use this for teaching. And there's all kinds of other things that are gonna be happening around this kind of model and this concept. So uh, get in touch with me uh, via my blog or via the MDC, uh, if you're interested in learning more or helping me in this, long odyssey. Um, and thanks very much for your attention.